My welcome is double fold today. I want to welcome all of you to worship on this day, and I want to welcome Carol Wise, our interim pastor. I am delighted that you get to experience her preaching and leadership, and I am delighted that she gets to be with all of you, and that for the next four months, Carol and I will be part of a pastoral team. So welcome, Carol. I'm delighted you're here. We have a nice array of Linton Connect groups and they'll be coming the first week in March. You can check them out on our website at lavernecob.org under the Connect tab. Click on Linton Connect Signups. You can learn more about critical race theory or go walking with friends. You can learn more about your genealogy or go bird watching. You can do art or watch a movie together and, and more. There is one that will be offered virtually it aids the leaders in their planning to know if you're coming, so please sign up today. Next week, our youth are having a bake sale to raise money for National Youth Conference and Christian Citizenship Seminar. You need to pre-order, and tomorrow, February 21st, is the deadline. You can order right off our website at lavernecob.org and click on the Youth Fundraiser tab. If you live at a distance or you're not going to be here next Sunday or you gave up sweets this year, you can still help our youth with this fundraiser. You can sign up to give some of our youth baked goodies to someone who's living in assisted living. Next Sunday, February 27th, families with children birth through high school are invited to a pancake breakfast during spiritual formation hour. Please RSVP so we have enough pancakes ready. You can RSVP at lavernecob.org, click on the Connect tab, and go to Spiritual Formation. It costs money to keep the ministry of the Laverne Church of the Brethren going, so thank you. Thank you for your steady and gracious giving. If you have never given to the Laverne Church of the Brethren, but you have joined the, our worship or other ministries we offer, we ask you to consider helping us to keep our ministry going. You can give right through your own bank using Zelle, or you can click on the PayPal tab on our homepage at lavernecob.org, or you can write a check and mail it to the church office. Now let us join together to worship the one who was and is and shall be. Having been beautifully warmed into worship, I invite you to stand in body or spirit for the call to worship. With hearts grounded in the goodness of God and the love that sustains us, we come with gratitude for this community of faith that holds and nurtures us. With sense alive to the wonders of each day, and the aching beauty and need that surrounds us, we come with determination to live as those committed to a more just and humane world for all people and creatures. With imaginations open to the possibilities before us, we come with expectation for the days ahead, confident that God, our help in ages past, walks with us on this sacred journey.
From the Hebrew Scriptures, Job chapter 8. Inquire now of bygone generations and consider what their ancestors have found, for we are but of yesterday, and we know nothing, for our days on earth are but a shadow. Will they not teach you and tell you and utter words out of their understanding? Another scripture from the, from the Hebrew scriptures, from the book of Ecclesiastes. I know that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken from it. God has done this so that all should stand in awe before God. That which is already has been, that which is to be already is, and God seeks out what has gone by. Susan said to me, um, oh, by the way, um, the National Hot Rod Association <laughs> Internationals is being held this weekend right there at the Pomona racetrack just down the street. And I thought, wow, this, this really is a homecoming. It's, uh, <laughs> I, have, I have so many memories of that intrusive uh, roar during very sensitive times in, in worship. So maybe there's just something to be said for consistency in the world. But I really want to thank you uh, for this opportunity to be with you as, um, as an interim pastor. The, the invitation was unexpected and uh, kind, of a, kind of a rupture in my life, but it has really captured my imagination. I'm, I'm so glad to be here and am particularly delighted to be able to work um, with Susan and Amanda and Tom and Corlin and Kelly and the, the, the musicians and just the amazing um, staff that you have collected that keeps this church both beautiful and alive. It's, it's also um, just a joy to see so many people who have meant so much to me over the years. And it's very exciting to note the changes that have occurred within this community and the many new faces and programs that are happening. Um, even though the pandemic has been truly stressful I still feel a vibrancy and life here that it's so encouraging. So I think I have um, three primary things that I can offer to this community in the coming year. Um, the first is a genuine sense of love and affection for this church. You opened your arms to me um, as a very green seminary graduate years ago and helped to shape and nurture me uh, in ways for which I remain forever grateful. You both challenged and cared for me, forgiving my mistakes and overlooking my flaws. Um, I learned a lot when I was here. And in addition, um, coming as I am from being the director of BMC, the Brethren Mennonite Council for LGBT Interests, I always knew that this congregation would be there in solidarity, and this knowledge meant the world to me. So I hope that I can offer something back now in this later stage of my life. Uh, secondly, I have tremendous confidence in the abilities and leadership of this congregation. Some of the smartest and kindest people that I have ever known are part of this community, and it seems that you just keep deepening the pool. I look forward to being with you as you celebrate and reflect on the exceptional leadership that's been offered by Susan and Donna, and begin to plan for future challenges and needs. I have absolute confidence that this congregation will make good and strong decisions. And finally, I find um, that I actually have a lot of energy for this work, which um, in some ways is a little bit of a surprise to me. <laughs> you know, during, doing, doing 
queer advocacy work um, in the Church of the Brethren is kind of hard on your soul and it can distort your perceptions. Um, so it, it feels like uh, such a gift to be here with a community that cares deeply about important issues and genuinely strives to be a community of authentic welcome and love. It's a breath of fresh air that fills and energizes me. So please, please do feel free to drop by my office now that it's open and uh, set up or set up a time to, to meet together in person or by Zoom, by phone. I'd love to get to know you and just sit and talk about life and its possibilities or maybe take a walk together. Um, on a practical note, I adore coffee and so I'm happy, happy to meet you in any coffee shop at almost any time. I, I look forward to sharing time together. So the past, uh, present, and future walk into a bar. I'll confess that I love a good mystery, political thriller, or spy novel. They are like candy to me. The only difference being that when I consume chocolate, I gain weight, and when I consume spy novels, I lose sleep. But, um, but I, did, I did read Bill Clinton's and Hillary Clinton's new uh, political thrillers that they both co-wrote with established writers. Um, perhaps no surprise, in uh, Bill Clinton's The President is Missing, it's the president who saves the nation, <laughs> while in Hillary Clinton's State of Terror, it's the Secretary of State who does the same thing. <laughs> I, I especially enjoyed the uh, collaboration with Hillary Clinton and that Queen of Mysteries, Louise Penny, that produced State of Terror. In the book, Ellen Adams is an older, middle-aged, middle overworked, and undervalued Secretary of State who is pitted against international terrorists and homegrown traitors who are out to destroy democracy. The potential for a nuclear bomb explosion is imminent. Um, in the novel, Secretary Adams is helped in her role by a childhood friend and close State Department counselor confidant named Betsy Jamison. The two verify their identities when they're emailing or texting each other by using this very clever code that involves grammatical puns. So for example, one types, an oxymoron walks into the bar and the other responds, and the silence was deafening. They have lots of them. A mixed metaphor walks into a bar, seeing the handwriting on the wall, but hoping to nip it in the bud. <laughs> a synonym strolls into a tavern. But my, my absolute favorite, <laughs> my absolute favorite was this one. The past, present, and future walk into a bar and they are all tense. <laughs> it, it took me a moment, but... Well, of course they were all tense. Anyone who has ever been at a large family gathering knows that the confluence of the past, present, and future has the potential to usher us into risky, even dangerous territory particularly if the event is infused with alcohol. There is the past, often striving to hold on and keep us fixed in a particular place and time. The present, pushing us to forget the past and live in the moment, seemingly free of any encumbrances. And then the future, pulling us towards something for which we may or may not be prepared and may or may not be good for us. If we cling stubbornly to the past, we miss experiencing the surprising wonders and beauty of each day. If we live only for today, we forfeit imagination. If we focus only upon the future, 
we diminish the richness of the past and hard-gained wisdom. The past, present, and future ask and call forth different parts of us, both individually and as a community. Living amidst the clang of all three can be confusing and messy, unsettling and exciting all at the same time. The Bible reflects this ambivalence about the relationship between the past, present, and future. In 2 Isaiah, the prophet says, do not remember the former things or consider the things of old. I'm about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth, do you not perceive it? For a weary people, this is a message of hope for a better future. In the Job text, Job's friend Bildad, the Shuite, counsels Job to look to the past to figure out the root of his suffering. For inquire now of bygone generations and consider what their ancestors have found, for we are but of yesterday and we know nothing, for our days on earth are but a shadow. His words are a reminder that the past matters. As Faulkner so eloquently stated, the past is never dead, it's not even past. Even Jesus is inconsistent. In Matthew 6, he tells his followers not to worry about the future, saying, so do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worries of its own. Today's trouble is enough for today. It's a very carpe diem, almost casual approach to living. And there is also an apocalyptic Jesus who warns about the end times and admonishes his followers to always be on guard. According to Luke 21, this Jesus dwells on the coming chaos and destruction of the end times and adamantly advises his followers to, quote, be alert at all times, praying that you will have the strength to escape all these things that will take place. It's confusing, although I, I actually appreciate the ambivalence of the texts. They feel real as people wrestle with the demands and the pull of the past, present, and future upon their lives and in their relationships with one another and the holy. Multicultural educator Robin DiAngelo writes candidly about her experience of growing up poor and white. When she was two, her parents divorced and her mother was left to raise her two children on her own, a circumstance that pushed them into deep poverty. The family occasionally lived out of their car, faced numerous convictions, lacked food and other basic needs. D'Angelo writes, I have never understood people who say we were poor, but we didn't know it because we had lots of love. Poverty hurts. It isn't romantic or some form of living simply. Poor people are not innocent and childlike. The lack of medical and dental care, the hunger and the ostracization are concrete. The stress of poverty made my household much more chaotic than loving. It also set her apart from her peers in ways that she soon internalized as being shameful, dirty, and not normal. Feeling that there was something wrong with her vis-a-vis -vis her white peers, she grew not to trust her own voice or her own power. She particularly found herself falling silent in conversations involving race and realized that it was because it was here that she found a place where she could bond with her white colleagues and feel a sense of belonging and, spirit and superiority that her poverty had denied her. In reflecting upon her past, she writes, these marks of poverty limit me in more than one, in more than what I believe or where I think I belong. 
They also interfere with my ability to stand up against injustice. For as long as I believe that I am not as smart or as valuable as other white people, I won't have the courage to challenge racism. The past matters. Individually, our past matters. Collectively, our past matters. Our past can be weighty and paralyzing. They can be illuminating and grounding. They can fill us with shame and sometimes with arrogance. They can make us fearful or overly satisfied. They can be all of these things at once and also more. Process theology developed by Alfred North Whitehead takes the past seriously. In each new moment of becoming, the influence, they say, of the past is deeply felt, and it is often heavy and weighty. We are tempted thus, thus to merely repeat what has been because that just seems the path of least resistance. It's familiar. It doesn't seem to demand much. It feels easy. But in each new moment, according to Whitehead, there is also the ongoing creativity of God, who is constantly, constantly luring us to be something more than we have been, more bold, more courageous, more loving, more forgiving, more curious, more just, more aware. It is a call to risk and change, to novelty and creativity. I appreciate this understanding of the intricate interplay between the past, present, and future that is reflected in process thought. It makes sense to me on a very basic level. I affirm the way that it refuses to simply dismiss history and the multitude of ways that history has shaped and formed us over the years and generations. Our losses, our joys, our mistakes and struggles mean something. At the same time, we are not hopelessly bound to that past. God is continually inviting us to be co-creators in the sacred work of love between us, within us, and in our engagement with the world, not in a superficial or trite fashion, but in ways that really matters, in ways that make a difference. We can be agents in shaping a different, bolder future. There is hope even as it places deep demands upon us. The past, present, and future walk into a bar, and they are all tense. For sure. It is risky indeed. But the moment also offers a glorious opportunity to reflect, to share, to learn, to experience, to celebrate, grieve, appreciate, evaluate, dream, imagine, enjoy. New possibilities can emerge, fresh insights, a deepened appreciation for things shared and experienced. In the months ahead, this congregation has a special opportunity to think deeply about its past to rejoice and live in the love and commitments that are present today, and to dream and plan for an even more vibrant future. So much good has already happened. So much good is yet to be. It's a time of affirmation, possibility, and also the holy risk associated with being co-creators with God. And what I know is that I look forward to doing this sacred work with you. Thanks be to God.
Guided by wisdom from the past, inspired by dreams for the future, secure in the love that unites us, may we go in peace and joy to serve and love a hurting world. Amen.